Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here. You can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter or of course you can subscribe to this channel, Let's Talk Boxing. Let's talk about the heavyweight division, in particular Alan Babic and his psychology. I'm going to get into that a little bit later on. I also want to talk about uh, Martin Bacoli and the two are linked, all right? This isn't just two random heavyweights that I've picked out. Basically, the zone put out a tweet and they said, who's next for, for Babic? And they had screenshots of Hergovic, Zhang, uh, Jagber, and Bacoli. And I basically tweeted to say, look, forget Hergovic. You've got to build up Babic as a commodity. You've got to have people believe in, wow, could he actually cause Hergovic a problem or two? At least to believe that in Croatia. Then you've got yourself a big domestic derby. You've got yourself a fight that could sell out an arena in his homeland. You know, it makes for a good fight. That's an interesting fight, an interesting spectacle. What I did, though, say is that Zhang and Bacoli would be interesting. Now, Billy Nelson, who follows me on Twitter, the trainer of um, Martin Bacoli, he took exception to this. And he said Bacoli would destroy him, mate. He, it, it wouldn't go for the fifth, into the fifth round. There's levels to this sport. Now, regardless of where you stand on this, whether you think Bacoli destroys him, or whether you think the savage can't be hurt that easily and be there swinging till the end, regardless of what your opinion is, it's still interesting. And here is why. Neither guy is British born, we understand that, right? Bacoli is Congolese, Babic is Croatian, but they're both based in the UK, they're both popular. In particular, Babic has built up a real cult following. But so it's almost like a domestic clash, a big domestic clash, right? Um, and you know the build up would be fantastic because the Babic can talk. Forget Bacoli, even his trainer, Billy Nelson, can talk. He loves to cause a bit of a stir. You know, Dillian White's going to be involved dropping his 50 cents in there so you've got this brilliant build-up all of a sudden it's going to be a laugh a minute there's going to be tension there's going to be hilarity it's quality and for the fight itself regardless of where you think what you think however long it lasts even if it's two three rounds you know it's going to be fireworks because Babic comes to fight Bacoli comes to fight so you're talking about a quality spectacle a great affair to watch the other thing as well Although Martin Bacoli has got bigger wins than Babic on paper, guys like Kuzmin, guys like Marius Vak, among the, I don't want to call them casuals, but the, because maybe casuals don't even know who Babic is, but the lighter end of the hardcore, right? Those that will not, that might not be able to name you the top 30 heavyweights in, in the sport, but could tell you anyone that appears on the zone, on Sky, on BT, you know, those sorts of, of guys. They're going to they're going to be aware of Babich and they're going to rate him highly. A lot more aware of him, perhaps, or rate him more highly, perhaps, than they do a guy like Marius Vak, who's operated at a higher level, but is now more of an opponent. And I was chatting to Hatman about this particular, not this particular fight, but this topic recently, actually, on his Discord. If you haven't signed up to his Patreon, you really have to. We talk about all sorts of things on there. And I was talking to him about Highland on a movie, and he's not actually seen it, but we were talking about how in that movie, when you beat an, uh, an opponent, when one warrior kills another warrior, he absorbs his powers, right? In some regards, that would apply here to an extent. Not quite his physical prowess, but in terms of the fan base that he has, he's going to get more respect, more hype go his way from beating Babbage than you would beating guys that have operated at a higher level than Babbage. Okay, so... It makes sense for Bacoli long term. Now, Bacoli, according to Michael Benson, this happened 13 hours ago, right? I'm on Twitter right now. According to Michael Benson, seven hours ago, it was revealed that uh, Bacoli has accepted a fight to fight Tony Yoka in December in France. Now, obviously, if he was to beat Tony Yoka, that catapults him into another stratosphere. Forget the Babich fight, right? He's just a different level now. He's going to be seeking to like get in there with big big names in the sport if he doesn't win that though the Babich fight makes sense for the reasons i've explained it could then re-catapult him back into the into a good position at least in the domestic scene he could still be finding a way to get a bigger named brit maybe you know a bigger name fight people will be bacoli will be on the lips of fans and so it makes sense let me know what your take is on that uh how do you think bacoli fares against tony yoka and do you see the Babich fight as one that you would be interested in seeing? Or do you agree with Billy Nelson that it's a mismatch and that there's no point in seeing it and the fact that it's a mismatch would mean you wouldn't enjoy it? Now, let's talk a little bit about Alan Babich himself. And I want to talk about the psychology of this man because to me, Alan Babich has the psychology of a gambling addict. 
if you were to consider what a gambling addict does, right? A gambling addict doesn't bet in order to make a profit. He doesn't see himself as an investor. I've known gamblers that are like that. I knew one particular guy who would only bet two, sorry, once every two to three months. And he'd be looking at odds every single day. But he'd only bet once every two to three months. He was robotic, clinical, very, very disciplined. When he would bet every two to three months, he'd bet big. Obviously, big is, you know, relative. There are, you know, I'm not talking about a high roller that's betting tens of thousands. But he would be betting sort of four-figure bets. And his aim by the end of the year was to try and make a five-figure profit. That was his aim. But think about the level of discipline to be looking at all these football matches, all these tennis events, whatever it was that he was betting on. But to only ever bet when he felt that the bookies had drastically mispriced something. If he felt that it was drastically mispriced, which doesn't happen too often, then he'd go big. That's a professional gambler. That's someone who's who's very clinical, very robotic with the way they gamble. The majority of gamblers don't fall into that category. The majority of gamblers take risks that might be bigger than they want to recognize because they're chasing bigger winnings. And, you know, you'll hear this a lot. You'll see a lot of guys who will play bet, place bets on a guy that they think will lose a fight. But they'll say, yeah, yeah, but he's... He's highly valued. Now, I've always been, I don't gamble anymore, but I was always a value better. But I would bet according to, I'd hedge bet. And long-time subscribers here will know we did very well on this channel when we were doing that. But I would bet according to what I would essentially think would happen. I wouldn't mind betting on the favorite if I think the favorite's going to win. Whereas there are some people that will always bet on the underdog or always bet on someone who are oh, three to one. I think we can get a result away at this particular football team when the likelihood is you're not going to. Because what you're seeking to do is not necessarily chase the, the money. It's not the investment. It's the winning. It's the overcoming of an obstacle. It's overcoming those odds. And that's what a lot of gamblers can become addicted to. And when you observe gamblers who are addicted and in therapy for their addiction, what you will often see is that in some weird respect, they're actually addicted to the losing element of it. And I'll explain why, right? Let's say you've got a guy who's got, we'll use a nice round number. Let's say he's got a, a wage, a monthly wage of a thousand pounds a month. If he goes and places a 500 pound bet and he wins and it was evens money, so he's doubled his money. So now he's got 500 pound profit. That next bet that he places, let's say he places it for 200, he won't feel much pressure. You'll often hear a gambler say, well, I lost, but it was all right because it was from previous winnings. So in other words, they see it as money they're willing to write off. Well, it was from profits, right? It's not a big deal. It's from profits. That's how they see it. Now, imagine he was to have lost that first bet of 500 pounds. Now, half his monthly salary has gone. He's now under pressure with that next bet that he's going to put down a 500 pound. He wants that 500 pound that he lost back. There's pressure. He's chasing the bet. So he places that second 500 pounds. If he loses that, he's just lost his entire month's salary on that bet. So now think of the pressure on winning that bet. Think of the excitement. There's no longer that case of, oh my word, man, if, if you know, big deal. If I lose, I'm, I lose a 200 pound bet. Well, it was winnings anyway. You know, I'm still £300 in profit. Even if I was to put it all and lose all £500 of that profit, well, I didn't lose anything because it was profits. That's the mentality. There's less pressure. Whereas when you have to win, that pressure, that's what gets their juices flowing. That is what makes the addict the addict. It's not the money. It's the process. It's the roller coaster ride. Now, consider some of the things that Alan Babich says and does in the ring and outside the ring. Firstly, in the ring, let's talk about the Molina fight. And generally, generally speaking, he loves to, what the wire used to call running red lights. He likes to take risks. Against Molina, he was a lot more careful. He was actually on the edge of range. He was fainting before jumping in, using that lead hand a lot to, to, to faint. And Molina was countering him very well at points. But there were other points where he was falling short with that right hand. And then Babich would come back in and go to work. So it wasn't just a case of him being a caveman like he has been in the past where he just walks to the forward and starts swinging. He realized that this was a step up. That Molina is a guy who, if Molina had to, if you put Molina in the Coliseum, right? And you said to him, if you lose this fight, you're going to die. Like you're fighting to the death. He'd actually be decent. Like he'd be okay. He'd be better than he is now. He's shown that in the past. He's reached a higher level and he, he'd be decent. 
The problem with Molina, in my opinion, is that he has no will to win. And I don't want to question a man's heart who's brave enough to step into the ring, but everything is relative. And compared to other heavyweights, you'd have to say he has very little heart. This is just the reality. Um, but in terms of his capabilities, he's got pretty heavy hands. He He's a thinking fighter. Um, and when he's not looking for an excuse to, to end the fight and go home with a paycheck, he's capable of a thing or two. So Babich had to think. He still takes risks, but he had to think a little bit. But nonetheless, you do see that willingness to jump inside, stay inside and throw big shots. You saw him go to war against the journeyman in his last outing, right? Well, think about that rant he had most recently at the press conference. In the presser, he was basically saying how he's begging for somebody to knock him out. Now, you obviously got to take that with a pinch of salt because he likes to talk and he likes to entertain. But he was saying, I'm not afraid of being knocked out. I want to be down and get back up. It's happened to me a million times in my life. I had zero. I, was, I had one foot out of the sport of boxing. I was going to walk away before Dillian White gave me this opportunity. And I can't wait to lose it all again. I want to know what my top level is. I'm going to get to that top level when I lose. And I know this is my level and I've been knocked out. Fair enough. But until then, I'm going to bring the war. But I want to go down. I want to get up. He wants that war. Isn't that the mentality of a guy who's not just willing to... Oh, he, he also said, he also said, I'm going to be reckless. I'm going to take chances. This is what I do. I'm doing it for the average Joe, not just the hardcore boxing fans. And he's loved for it. Just read the comments on various YouTube videos. Go and watch the Matchroom press conference and look at the live comments and the comments that went up afterwards. People love him. And they love him because of that gambling mentality. He's a guy who is willing to risk losing it all because it gets his juices flowing to take those risks, to test himself, to go to war, to try and dominate another man physically, mentally, emotionally. And potentially to be dominated himself. He says, I want to sleep for 10 days, knock me out, I want to be knocked out for 10 days. Now, like I said, a lot of it is just bravado. But the way he fights and the risks he's willing to take, he's actively calling for Hergovic. I think that needs to marinate. But you do believe him when he says he wants to fight him in an arena in Zagreb and that he's going to go and try and smash the hell out of him. This is who he is. He's a gambler. Now, the problem with a gambler is that they don't realise when they've taken on too much of a gamble. The more success they have, the bigger the risks they want to take. So now he's beaten Molina, he is going to want another step up. And that's why I suggested Bacoli. Let's say he was to fight Bacoli. If he was to beat Bacoli, which is a massive step up from Molina, he then gets catapulted into the Hergovic fight. What happens if he beats Hergovic? I don't think he would, but we're just saying what happens if he was to beat Hergovic? He's then going to want the best. He's going to want Fury. He's going to want Wilder. He's going to want AJ and Usyk. That's who this guy is. Eventually, in my humble opinion, he's going to hit that ceiling. I don't think he'll get to that level. And it's nothing against Babich. Maybe he's a lot better than what he's let on. You're right. He's got an extensive amateur career. Maybe he's just not put his full repertoire of skills on display for us to see. But from what I've seen... I don't think this is a guy who's going to become dominant heavyweight champion, but he's willing to keep shooting for the stars until he comes crashing down to the ground. That is who Alan Babich is, in my humble opinion. Let me know what you think. Let me know your take on everything we've discussed today. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care. God bless. Chat to you soon.